Welcome to All Things Delivered, the show where we'll take you behind the scenes of the latest technologies in supply chain, transportation, and logistics, a multi-trillion dollar essential sector of the global economy. On this premiere episode, we look into the crystal ball of predictive analytics to solve one of the biggest hurdles of supply chain planning and execution. Stick around. Technology innovation has never moved as fast as it is today, and it will never move this slow again. So now is the time to accelerate your supply chain transformation at the speed of AWS. Join us to explore the supply chain of the future today. Today, we look at the manufacturing stage of the supply chain and how the concept of just-in-time delivery is being pushed to the limit. Machine learning and cloud services like Amazon SageMaker and AWS Glue are used to enable ETA prediction, reduce in-transit inventory cost, and enable yard management optimization. Later, I'll be talking with subject matter experts Kimberly Haggerty and Daniel O'Coin about what all this means for the supply chain of the future in our Insights Roundtable. But now, for our manifest segment, let's discuss with inner wisdom how multiple machine learning models can be combined to increase the accuracy of just-in-time delivery prediction. Robin, thank you for being with us today. Hi, you're welcome. We have seen how complex it's becoming for uh, every business you know, across supply chains to enable just-in-time delivery. Would you like to share with us how Inner Wisdom helps customers to address this level of complexity? I think that the challenge is really to drive towards just-in-time delivery in supply chains and distribution chains. Um, and that's, I guess, the primary goal. But to do that, really, we're comp- there's a number of competing concerns. Um, so I think we want to have really good predictability of the supply chain, be able to predict um, when things will be delivered with, with high accuracy that come out of the supply chain. And that also has to be balanced with growing emissions regulation and a sort of regulatory environment. Um, and we also want to drive costs out of the supply chain. Um, and those things can be kind of uh, two sides of the same coin as well. We have been working on this together for a couple of years by now. And we, we have also seen how important it is to match uh, industry experts uh, and practitioners with uh, data scientists. So for instance, having uh, trackers and uh, year managers explaining to data scientists what, what is the insight that they need to extract from data. So I think we, we have a phrase in inner wisdom that we let the data do the talking, but it's also crucial to engage with the business and understand the nuances of the business process that we're modeling. We want to decompose the supply chain business process into, into constituent parts um, that we're going to model and predict independently. So that in that example of uh, interacting with the yard managers, uh, one of the things that we found in one of our projects was around the fact that actually different depots or yards were actually su- uh, sharing stock across uh, across the supply chain, which obviously is crucial for us to to model in our to, to handle in our modeling in order to get the best accuracy. My understanding is that the scientists working on your models are uh, using quite extensively Amazon SageMaker. Uh, would you like to tell us more about the use of this uh, AWS service? We use SageMaker for multiple discrete models, uh, machine learning models that we want to create, um, and SageMaker allows us to train all those in parallel um, at, at good speed, so we can scale that up. Um, and also to do inference, both batch inference and real-time inference um, at, at big scale. So we use SageMaker for both the, the training and the, and the inference pipelines. Which kind of data, uh, which kind of raw data you are ingesting? One is the uh, shipment plans, so the the, uh, the plan of how, uh, how goods will flow through the supply chain, what routes they'll take. And that's um, quite slow moving data, like every time there's new goods to move. Um, and then there's the much faster, higher velocity data, so event-based data, which is the uh, the events that are being recorded as as goods move from step one to step two to step three and so on, um, which is much faster. So those are typically in JSON format, and and we would ingest the the, the batch style data typically. So we ingest using AWS Glue as a service, probably in um, micro batches or sort of hourly batches or fifteen minute batches. Not you know. Uh, so it's um, kind of near to real time. It doesn't have to be super real time. Whereas on the event stream, typically we're ingesting, so streaming data. So it might be managed Kafka service, for example, with Kafka topics that we're pulling from and, and then persisting. How do you store the data? So in, when it comes to storage, uh, so we generally favor a polyglot persistence model. So we're storing 
data in maybe one or two different formats or multiple formats for different reasons, for different non-functional requirements, characteristics, basically. So for the, the large uh, batch style data, so this would include reference data, but all the kind of historical uh, tr data of, about information um, transiting through the supply chain, we'll store that in a, we'll sort of relationalize it um, with AWS Glue and store it, say, typically in Redshift um, in a relational format. For the more event-based data, um, or data that we need for real for access really quickly at inference time, we'll store that in something like DynamoDB, where we've got really fast um, puts and reads, uh, so that we can retrieve that very quickly to make real time predictions, real time inferences. Yeah, and and what I think is is very clever about your uh, uh, your architecture is that needs to process multiple shipments uh, in a very quick manner, and also uh, uh, combine multiple models. So how do you orchestrate and control all the execution? For the training path um, for orchestration, so we're, we're we're controlling things that don't have to be uh, that fast as in, as in training. As a uh, we'll train the models um, frequently, but um, on a, maybe on a scheduled basis, on a triggered basis, um, when we detect model drift, for example. Uh, so for that, we will use um, a scheduler, um, which is driving into uh, step functions. So we typically, use step functions, which then allows us to orchestrate the components on the. Inference side, when we're doing much more real-time, you know, real-time inferences, then we'll typically have our orchestration, our sequences controlled in, say, a lambda function, uh, so we can run them and scale them up very quickly, um, run them very quickly, but also scale them up for you know to high volume. And uh, you mentioned the, the the training and the inference flows. So can you talk me through them a little bit more into details? We will collect the data from Redshift. So this is the bulk of training data. So it could be millions and millions of records. Uh, we then need to go through a pre-processing stage. So we feature engineering or data pre-processing where we want to curate that data into the format exactly that's needed for, for the SageMaker training step. Um, so typically we'll centralize all that uh, pre-processing sort of feature engineering into, into a container. Um, and then once the data is prepared, we then we need to train multiple SageMaker models. So what we'll do is we'll use the, the basic the power of the Amazon cloud to train multiple models in parallel so we can scale that up very nicely uh, rather than making it sequential. Once the these models have been trained, then we'll combine those into a single container which we'll store in a model registry. In the inference flow, we want to reuse the pre-processing code. So we'll reuse our, our feature engineering container. So it has to be exactly the same between training and inference. That's crucial. And we need to version that with our models. Um, so it's a nice, efficient deployment package uh, that uh, keeps the kind of run cost down. Um, and we can also build logic into that, that that combines the predictions from all our, all our models together into one end duration. So we can combine all that in one container. From a speed point of view, just to give an idea, so the, the prediction latency, so how long it takes to make a, an inference, is generally less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, that's what what I mean by kind of near real time. From a business impact point of view, which is the real key metric, uh, what we've managed to achieve with our customer in the, the global automaker uh, in North America is we've managed to achieve a, an accuracy improvement of 45% on the, the prediction of the, the day that the, uh, the goods will be delivered. And that's compared with our previous, um, the previous kind of non-machine learned based approaches. What challenges do you think are still unsolved? I think one remaining challenge, and this this challenge will will stay with us, is that just expectations of of supply chain predictability and also uh, the sort of just in time delivery expectation are just increasing like all the time. So there's a need to continually improve the accuracy and predictability of these um, of our models. And then a kind of much more practical challenge is that supply chain data sometimes it's manually collected at various steps, uh, you know, in a depot, for example. Um, and so data availability. Um, and just getting access to data can sometimes be a challenge, although that's a diminishing problem, but uh, one that's kind of slowly, slowly playing out, I would say. Uh, so what are, what, are, what are the opportunities that you see at the horizon? Yeah, so I think that then once we've built these, uh, these models, these SageMaker models that we're combining, then this gives us a great tool to then take it to the next level and basically move into prescriptive analytics where we can run what-if scenarios through those models. What happens if this disruption happens in some point of the supply chain? How will it behave? So essentially like a digital twin strategy. Um, and also essentially get insights as to how to improve our supply chain uh, to make it more robust um, and, and run those through the models um, before we make changes in the real world. So I think that's the, the kind of next level of business optimization of the supply chains that this then enables.
Robin, thank you for sharing your insight with us. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, bringing to our customers together these, uh, uh, these models and prediction capabilities. Yeah, you're very welcome. I have here with me Kimberly Haggerty from the line of business point of view and Daniel O'Coin from the technology perspective. Thank you for being with us today. So, Kimberly, we have seen how helpful is uh, in a wisdom in delivering more accurate and quicker prediction uh, uh, in terms of just-in-time delivery. Uh, we're talking about 45% increase in, in accuracy. If you look at the way manufacturing is set up and designed today, it's highly synchronized and often moving flow lines across multiple different production lines. So getting that higher visibility and that higher accuracy into prediction really makes you get the right part to the right place at the right time in order to get that continuous flow, improve productivity, and obviously improve output to the customer. And uh, uh, what really ent enticed me about the approach of InnoWisdom, and I think is very clever, is their way of breaking down uh, uh, a substantial, a big uh, prediction problem into sub-problems. So they are using what's, what I would call fit-for-purpose models. And basically, this is just smaller machine learning models that are solving a small business problem, and it's solving it well. And then they're combining the intelligence that they're gaining from, these, from the modularity into solving one larger business problem. Especially in a high volume manufacturing site, those business decisions really need to be point of use and they really need to be independent, but they also need to be able to scale both horizontally and vertically. Uh, I, I totally agree with you, uh, but I also have to say that this uh, uh, entails a substantial level of complexity in terms of uh, managing thousands of shipments in parallel and doing prediction on multiple modes of transportation. So. The, the correct way to do this is using a, a fully managed machine learning operation process and mechanism. So you look at all the manual decisions that are made today, being able to self-learn and continuously optimize those decisions now allows you to automate and really scale and provide a larger scope and impact of those decisions from a machine learning standpoint. This is going to provide a couple of things. So Amazon SageMaker will allow you to automate your workflows and allow you to uh, keep track of your data, your code, and related artifacts. It's going to allow you to build out continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. And finally, it's also going to allow you to de automatically detect bias in your models. So we have seen how just-in-time delivery allows uh, increased throughput and productivity, uh, how you need to achieve this by breaking down a big problem into more manageable, small machine learning models, and uh, how machine learning operation should be uh, the tool that allows scalability. Thank you for joining me in this uh, first uh, roundtable of All Things Delivered. At the end of each episode, we provide you with key takeaways, some tips. So let's get to it with today's focus on manufacturing optimization. First, look ahead. You might consider to adopt machine learning to increase the accuracy and the speed of predictions. Performances of even complex multimodal supply chain networks can be made more predictable. Second, you might want to work smart, not hard. So the volume of data, compute power, and orchestration work can become staggering. So why don't you use an architecture with fit-to-purpose models and fully managed machine learning operation frameworks, such as SageMaker? And lastly, be bold, don't be shy. Once you have good quality data, a combination of well-trained models, and automated orchestration, why don't you think about building prescriptive analytics and assisted decision-making tools. I hope you found this first episode insightful. Please return for our next edition, where we'll be joined by Here Technologies to explore the most clever geopositioning solutions for cargo tracking and tracing. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>